Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to this Monash Software Systems and Cybersecurity Seminar session. Today, we are happy to welcome Omar Hakkak from Monash University. Uh, Omar is research is on new approaches to developing and designing mobile apps that take into account the human aspects of end users and team members. He is interested in developing techniques so that M Health and emerging apps are designed and developed in a way to better meet uh, user needs. And his PhD thesis focused on large scale app reviews and related artifact analysis, including developing tools to analyze app reviews, privacy policies, developer responses to reviews, and tools to advise developers on app development to address key usability, accessibility, and privacy related issues. And this, today's topic is very related to this research area. And he will talk to us about better identifying and addressing diverse issues in M Health and emerging apps. Um, thank you, Omar. And I'll leave this yeah. to you. Thanks, Mohammed, for the nice introduction. And hello, everyone. And thanks um, for attending today. So, can you see my screen? Yep, all good. Yeah, all good. perfect. So, um, today I will be talking about our latest research about better identifying and addressing diverse issues in M health and emerging apps so let's start with the outline so we will talk about the background and the motivation of our work the research questions we addressed in this work the method of our research which contains of four parts and the related uh, research that we have done and in this, we will also show the main key contributions and the major findings. So let's start with the background and motivation. So in our research, we actually have a wider definition. So for, for example, when I talk about emerging apps, so those apps are who are actually developed in um, middle of uh, an emergency, like such as COVID-19 apps or, you know, bushfires or so on. And with accessibility issues are actually those issues that may actually affect uh, types of users from using an app properly. So not just, you know, for the disabled people and so on. So we have kind of Wide, wider definitions. And I would like to list some uh, interesting facts about, for example, why we are focusing on M Health apps. So, like the market of e health or M Health app is actually growing very fast, and there is high revenues and downloads count. And it, it may shock you that inactivity like leads to over 3.2 million people to die each year and according to the um, world health organization more than 30 percent of adults are actually um, seen as physically uh, unfit and there is actually heaps of m health apps in the mobile market but there is actually little evidence that they are working the way they are intended to um, work like for diverse reasons. And um, why we are actually focusing on emerging apps as well. So um, the cycle of having new emerging apps will likely continue in any emergency in the future so like bushfires floods other pandemics and so on and we saw that uh, governments actually were highly encouraging um, the residents and everyone to download and use COVID-19 apps and they could actually have played a very important role in stopping the global pandemic if 60 percent of people like um, downloaded and started uh, using them, which didn't happen, unfortunately. And actually, we find that there were some genuine users or who would like to, down, like to download and use 
COVID-19 apps, but they were not actually able to do so for some reasons. So, and evidenced by research, 61% of people who started using mHealth apps have managed to increase their physical activities. And mHealth apps could actually provide um, great control for people with chronic disease. And this will actually save money at the end since it decreases the burden on health um, resources. Also, mHealth apps allow people to keep fit by using fitness and workouts uh, apps. And I think like many of us are, are already using at least one of these apps. So why also we focused on emerging apps because they can actually be uh, beneficial to decrease economic and save lives during emergencies, pandemics, crisis, and so on. And emerging apps such as COVID-19 apps were uh, like are usually developed, designed and tested in a short time span compared to any other types of apps. And they, are required to be rolled out quickly. So they are much higher prone to accessibility issues since, since they are not tested properly, like for example, um, normal apps. And in our um, work, uh, we use user reviews and why we actually focus on user reviews because they are considered as a primary source of any available user feedback that is directly linked to app features and user experience. And star rating submitted in user reviews could influence users' decision on downloading or purchasing um, a specific app. And actually um, user, user uh, reviews and star ratings actually influence uh, people inspiration and interest to download or reuse these apps. So for example, you know, if I want to download uh, a specific app or like uh, when I go and search for it, if I find two apps, one have a good rating and the other have bad rating or bad reviews, you know, definitely I will go um, with a good one. And since user reviews are actually uh, honest feedback from people, so people are not influenced, you know, to um, yeah, to to submit it. It's by their own will. So M Health apps and emerging apps should be accessible by everyone in the society, regarding regardless of their age, gender, language, and so on. Uh, since they are improving and saving lives. But by looking at user reviews of these apps, we can find that millions of users are actually raising and reporting significant problems. So the research questions we have in this research was, how can we identify the most significant strengths and weaknesses uh, reported by the users of these apps? and how we can actually link the data generated by this analysis with the app updates done by the developers and designers. Do, when users are reporting an issue, for example, do they fix it or not? Like, so we were very interested to understand this um, um, link. And what are the main accessibility and privacy issues existing in um, mHealth apps and emerging apps? and how we can develop like guidelines and tools to help better development and design of mHealth apps. So this is the related uh, publications we, um, we had in this um, scope. So, and the last one is actually in um, the submission phase, so, yeah. So, Regarding as uh, a method of our work, so um, first of all, we have like automated and manual app reviews analysis. So we all know that um, there is a reviews uh, database, like um, like on the 
Apple Store, for example, the App Store or uh, Google Play for for Android. And actually, uh, these uh, reviews are publicly available. Everyone can see it. And so what we do, actually, we we try to um, like we we um, scrap like user um, reviews from both Apple Store and Google Play. And then after we have everything in our uh, database, um, we like, yeah, we, we do actually like some uh, um, initial kind of analysis where we actually see which languages is review. If it's not in English, you know, we translate it and so on. But yeah, so once we have uh, 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 the reviews in our database, we fetch a user reviews, we do some automated analysis like correct um, misspelled words, remove stop words, apply stemming and generate synonyms and classify the reviews into one or more aspect based on the list of the review on the list of keywords that we have. And then we generate some statistics for each aspect based on star rating, subcategory, and so on. So this is mainly for the automated analysis and for the manual analysis, which is done um, like by uh, several like people in this work. So we we now we have kind of set of um, reviews that are classified into several aspects. So now we need to see what are the issues. So we select a sample of each re of each um, um, like um, from each aspect. And then we manually analyze the reviews and identify issues and problems. Then we have meetings to resolve issues and updates the classifying um, keywords list so for example you know it might uh, we might uh, improve the accuracy and so like so on see that some reviews are um, classified incorrectly why this is happening and so on and improve again the accuracy of our um, tool and then we rerun our tool with updated uh, keyword list and manually reanalyze a sample of reviews and then we identify the major common issues and formulate the findings so and when i talked about version history and release notes analysis so uh, here are uh, a user reviews in um, um, uh, for example for covid safe app Someone was saying, I don't have an Australian mobile number. The app doesn't allow foreign numbers. So this seems to be a genuine user or a genuine person who wants to use the app, but can't, are not able to do it. And for example, someone here in the Polish version, he was saying that the app was highly funded, but it's only in Polish. So like he seems, of course, uh, to be genuine to use it, and he is not able to do so because he doesn't understand Polish. So, since, since the app, uh, that's why he's recommending that the app should be in English as well. But when we look at app version history, we find out that actually the developers of the app have um, sorted out uh, and fixed these issues and added support to international numbers. And in the Polish one, they added translations like in English and in Ukrainian. So you can see that some apps developers are actually working on and analyzing user feedback and actually trying to improve the app. So that's why we were interested which um, issues were solved, which issues were not, which apps the developers were able to solve the issues and which apps are not. So um, we also had um, part of our research was about privacy policies and data use agreements analysis. So um, we had a list of questions to evaluate app privacy uh, by analyzing privacy policy and data use agreements. 
And these questions allowed us to analyze and to see what data are created, kept, exchanged, and given to third parties, as well as with whom and why these data are shared. So, and this of course helped us to understand how mHealth and emerging apps handle user data. So, um, and the last part of our research that we actually developed um, some analysis and recommendation tools. So this is a, a screenshot for two parts in our um, analysis uh, tool for accessibility issues. So these are the questions that are actually showed uh, to uh, developers in order to see what the app provide and what the app do not provide. So, and then based on, uh, based on their answers to these questions, we give them evidence-based recommendations on how they can actually improve uh, the accessibility of uh, their apps and so on. So our work is not just analysis, but also, you know, like kind of having, giving guidelines and recommendations on how to solve these problems. So I will, let me start with this uh, privacy um, uh, study where we did an analysis of privacy issues and policies of e-health apps. So this is actually a post was um, done by the Australian Digital Health um, Agency on the 10th of May. You can see that the post was sponsored. It reached 1.8 million um, user and it had 190 uh, um, comments and it had only 600 reactions out of 1.8 million. And actually the reviews, um, so, um, just one moment. Yeah, um, yeah, so you can see, I'm just trying to, to show you the amount of resistance from people, you know, that they are not supporting to use, no thanks too much digital. Why does health department wants my tax information and so on? You see like there is all the comments where actually kind of people resisting. There was not a single even um, uh, um, supporting um, um, comment. And yeah, so you see like at that time there was 55 comments, uh, 51 comments recorded, but only three visible. And here you can see it was 191 uh, comments posted, but you know, they deleted most of them and only 60 existed. So, you know, they were removing any comments that are actually like going against their um, guidelines and so on. Anyway, so this shows you that people are worried about their privacy when it comes to uh, health information. And this actually like kind of makes sense because you are sharing kind of sensitive data and you don't know if this data is kind of leaked, you know, what's gonna happen. So let's move on. And the main key contributions we had in this study that we did automated and manual analysis of diverse privacy issues. And this resulted in having 37,000 um, reviews and we categorized these 37,000 reviews into eight privacy sub aspects, as we will see. And we developed a tool to calculate the readability of privacy policies and time users need actually to properly read them. Because again, we wanted to understand what's the issue, you know, like why users, for example, when they are submitting a, a user review and saying, ah, why does the app 
need my access to my location. However, this is not improving um, the functionality of the app. We wanted to understand this. Is it really stated in the privacy policies or just, you know, like the, um, the it's not. So anyway, so we, the eight sub aspects were scam, were ads, were policy related issues, were permissions related issues, data access and sharing, location, security, and trust and safety. And you can see that uh, the scam um, sub aspect was the highest badly rated one. So you can see it like um, around 89% of users who submitted as um, an issue re regarding a scam within e-health apps have actually given one star rating just. But on the other side, there is also many people who trust e-health apps and they think they are, it is safe. So you can see also that scam, scamming issues was the um, um, top praised one and the policy related issues was the lowest rated one with only 3% while with, with scamming it was 52%. So you can see that issues across different privacy sub aspects kind of um, uh, are raised in a different um, um, like ratio. And when, the, when we did actually privacy policy and data use agreements analysis, we find out that the privacy policies are very complex from a readability perspective. And it takes a, a large amount of time for users to read policies truly. So like imagine, you know, like, and, and we need to admit that actually when we read the policy, you know, like, or we find the policy, we just scroll it and, you know, we never read it. So, you know, like this is, it's a fact. And we find that there is numerous issues have been identified that eHealth app users are not fully aware of, you know, you can see it here. So, um, and we can see that actually some apps um, have tried to um, solve uh, this issue um, uh, by summarizing the pr their privacy policies in a table or so, but actually uh, this didn't um, uh, quite help because it's still vague. So, you know, you will not really understand what's happening. So do we share your data or not? It's still quite not clear. So the major findings of this study that scam and trust are the most common privacy sub aspects in user reviews where numerous users uh, consider e-health apps that demand hidden payments will likely be scams because you know, many apps, they just tell you it's for free and then, you know, they kind of tell you, ah, to use the premium sub subscription, you need to pay this amount of money or so. And it also, our analysis shows that most users do not read privacy policies before using e-health apps for several reasons. And that most privacy policies are complex and require over 15 minutes to be read by users. And e-health apps in general suffer from frequent data breaches and unauthorized access to user sensitive information. For example, you know, my fitness pal um, uh, was, uh, um, kind of hacked twice, you know, and all users information was um, leaked. And of course, laws and regulations such as the GDPR or a Australian Privacy Act, they actually do not specify the importance of using plain English in privacy policies. And the healthcare in the in technology sector must prioritize privacy safeguards to protect user confidentiality. And of course, there is better approaches needed to ensure that users are aware of the privacy policies before actually they kind of use the app. So um, the second study we did is M, M Health apps user reviews analysis. We actually extracted more 
over 5 million user, user reviews and we classified them into 14 aspects. We compared the satisfaction levels across subcategories and we see that what are the problem, what are the satisfaction. And we did kind of manual analysis of thousand review of each classified aspect. And we identify the um, significant issues and problems and we provide a set of recommendation on each analyzed aspect based on this study. And we find actually in this study that women health apps were recognized as the highest rated subcategory in our review and that fitness activity tracking was the lowest rated app subcategory because there was major um, flows and bugs uh, in multiple aspects such as connectivity for example and we find that privacy there there are privacy uh, major privacy concerns where 55 percent who raised privacy issues gave the app only one star rating and that's why actually after this study we decided to do the other uh, privacy study to to have a better understanding of why this is happening and we also did a study about accessibility issues in emerging apps. So we did automated and manual analysis of 220,000 user reviews of COVID-19 apps to identify the accessibility issues. And we did a detailed analysis of version history later release to notes to understand uh, what issues have been fixed, what issues have been not fixed. And we developed the EAAER tool, accessibility tool. And we actually tested and evaluated this tool with some real world app developers. And the developers indicated its promise in supporting more accessible emerging app development. So the major findings of this study that many people, um, cannot uh, download or access um, COVID-19 um, apps due to several reasons. First of all, they were unable, for example, to register. Something was preventing them doing this because for example, the apps only support national numbers or it requires national ID. So a quick example with, um, with COVID-19 uh, uh, app in Qatar, for example, they required a national ID for people to use it. And it was mandatory and all visitors and students and so on didn't have a national ID. So they were absolutely, you know, sitting home. They can't do anything without um, having the app. They can't do go shopping. They can't check in hotels and so on. So you know, like they were forcing people to do something, but they were not giving them any solution on how to um, do it. So, and some apps were only supporting the local country language. So any visitor or some, or anyone who doesn't understand um, this language will not be able to use the app. Some of the apps did not support all age groups where, for example, uh, less than 17, uh, years old you cannot or 18 years old you will not be able to download it from the app store and so on and we found that that several COVID-19 apps were not tested to be accessible by elderly or disabled users so accessible like they were kind of very unaccessible to like old people or old gen, uh, generation in, in general which were actually the most um, risky group you know during the pandemic and we find out that there is there are no tools or guidelines that prevent or reduce accessibility issues while developing emerging apps it's all was general guidelines for uh, um, for apps in general but nothing was for the emerging apps we also did uh, this related study uh, with COVID-19 uh, versus social media apps. So we were interested to know, you know, like why people use social media apps without any concern, you know, or privacy concern, why they use, um, but 
they have major concerns with the COVID ones. So what we did is that we did a manual analysis of privacy policies, terms and condition and data use agreements in COVID-19 apps and some uh, social media and productivity apps. And we analyzed, we did automated analysis of nearly 2 million user reviews. And we classified these reviews into five main aspects. And we provided evidence-based recommendation for developers and promoters of COVID-19 apps on what they did wrong and what they did right and how they can um, be kind of um, more, um, not accessible, but how, how they can actually promote, you know, for, uh, for uh, the app. Because based on our analysis, we actually found that COVID-19 apps better support privacy and limit data usage than social media apps like although people were kind of uh worried about this so you know like again people are happy you know to give their data to facebook and so and tiktok and so on but with covid19 apps that we're actually using a technology where the app developers will not know your real location since my phone is contacting your phone and we, both of our phones don't know where is the real location of the user. So, you know, like there is no major privacy issues and people were still worried. And we actually find that more COVID-19 apps reviews talk about privacy issues, but this was actually in a positive way. So many users were raising their uh, reviews that people should be less worried and they can delete, you know, like social media apps if they are worried about their privacy that much. And that COVID-19 apps, of course, were less stable and accessible and health officials and technologists needed to better um, raise awareness among, among individuals about their behavior and trust worthy of COVID-19 apps or emerging apps in general. And of course, more research needs to be implemented on how to um, uh, how to design and develop any future service app that needs to be rolled out quickly. So, and for this um, this part, for example, you know, like one of the shocking things we find that, for example, in Facebook that even if you are closing, you know, like your location services uh, from the app, they will still know your location and show you relevant ads from your IP address. So just you can imagine how it's, uh, how it is uh, there. And- uh, Can uh, I ask a question? Yeah, sure. For example, about this Facebook one, did you reach out to the developers and said that like, this is happening and uh, kind of, well, why are you doing this or are you planning to not do this or something? Is this like a bug or feature? Um, regarding which point, like, sorry. I did the location one, like even though- Yeah, because, yeah. because we, we all, we, we find this actually information about this, that they are accessing and getting your location from the IP address from their privacy policy. But as I mentioned previously, that's a privacy policy of, let's say Facebook, I don't know, like it's just so many pages, you know, like there is not a single normal user who will, you know, be able or have free time, you know, to read it properly, yeah. but they are kind of acknowledging that in their privacy policies, but they are not actually helping users to understand which data they collect and which data they are not collecting. So, you know, it's kind of, they are doing the right thing by stating everything, but at the same time, they are hiding it from users by, you know, just letting users just accept privacy policy and that's it, you know, like, and they are giving it in a long lengthy sentences where, you know, they kind of like, kind of, uh, they have, um, I, I wouldn't say sure, but they, they have, the highest, the higher chance that users, you know, will not see what are these issues and, you know, like what is, mm -hmm. 
what's done with the user's data. They will just, yeah. you know, click, okay, I accept or I consent and that's it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. And, and, and you can find it like, I mean, even just on your phone, you know, turn off location services on Facebook and you will still find them showing you restaurants, you know, around you in the ads and so on. So, you know, like it just, again, like they, they will always find a way. And even from browsing history, they are saying, you know, they check like your browsing history, you know, or, or, or your interaction with other apps. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, uh, and, and not just Facebook, you know, it's, uh, it's TikTok was the same and so on. So yeah, in this paper, we actually like did kind of very detailed analysis on, uh, on, um, yeah, what's um, going on. Or for example, Grammarly with like, with fixing grammar mistakes, you know, they say that we save uh, at that point, maybe things have changed, but when we did the analysis, you know, they clearly stated in the privacy policy that we actually keep users, uh, um, like they check every single thing you write, you know, and they keep it in the history for better research improvement and so on. So, you know, imagine every single text you are writing, you know, someone else is reading what you are writing. So, and, and then people were worried, you know, about COVID-19 apps where the majority of them were uh, using this contact tracing um, technology where actually the developers will not be able to know where is users located and so on. But anyway, let's uh, move to the last um, one. So uh, this was a mutual collaboration uh, uh, between uh, some researchers from Monash University, Deakin University and uh, University of Minnesota in, in, in the US. So we wanted like to investigate human aspects in uh, COVID-19 apps. And we actually investigated diverse human aspects appearing in app reviews of many COVID-19 apps. And we provided a categorization of these aspects. And we kind of saw whether these human aspects have been addressed um, or not in the, in the app. And we made our data and tools uh, available so we can help further research to build on our work. So, and the major findings of this that study was that reviews of COVID-19 apps discuss different human aspects as normal apps. So, and we found that actually um, the human aspect related reviews varies a lot among different apps and stores. So, you know, the human aspects, for example, that was raised here in Australia was different than the one who, which was raised in India, than the one in the US and so on. And we find that there are various reasons that led to human aspect related um, reviews. And we find that better appro approaches are actually needed to identify human aspects from the natural um, language. So, yeah, so it was kind of a very um, good study. And actually this study, uh, got the best paper award on the mobile uh, soft conference um, this year. So, yeah. So, yeah, I would like to also acknowledge that this work is uh, supported by the Australian Research Council and Discovery Project and Monash Fit. So, thanks a lot. Um, all for attending today and i'm happy to have any questions that you might have well, thank you very much omar for your interesting talk uh, do we have any questions from anyone you can either raise your hand and i'll unmute you and or you can type it in the uh, q a chat
Yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll ask the question while the others think about it. I think yeah, in one of your slides, you mentioned about these uh, uh, fitness apps. Uh, can, you, can you go to that slide, actually? Yeah, What's... sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, do you know why? <laughs> yeah. I... Women's health ones were like high, highly ranked, but or highly rated, yeah. the fitness ones were not. I, that seems a bit, I don't know, I, I, I'm not seeing any correlation. Yeah, exactly. This is was actually kind of very, very interesting that uh, in women e-health apps, even users were kind of raising issues. They still submit a good rating, you know, for the app. And actually, uh, we are kind of now doing another uh, analysis uh, study for women e-health apps just to kind of better understand what why this behavior is happening and um even the reviews you know when you submit a review you choose a nickname you know for for this review and for women e-health apps the names were, was kind of genuine names so for example you know you find uh um uh, maria you know whatever family name you know like i mean it's all kind of genuine reviews while in general e-health apps, you know, like let's say, you know, I submit a review saying uh, uh, under a nickname, you know, like uh, Momo 777, for example. So, so this is, I mean, for women e-health apps, we still didn't understand why this is happening because they were still raising issues within the apps but still giving good ratings while in fitness activity tracking we find out that the major two issues was that the app you know uh, claimed to be free you know and actually it's not so when you download the app and install it you find that you need to to pay a subscription and so on in order to use it. So this is one of the most major issues and it's not written in the description, you know, it's not written anything about this kind of concealed payment. And the second thing was about um, connectivity issues because, you know, like they require, uh, let, let's say, you know, I have uh, uh, my, um, uh, like a running uh, tracker app and I run, let's say, with my Apple Watch. Someone else, you know, have Jarmin Watch. Someone else have Samsung Watch and so on. So, you know, these apps were having major connectivity issues. And most, like, um, like most of the connectivity-related issues were saying, you know, um, I can use the app while using my Apple Watch, but my wife can't use it, you know, while using a Jarmin. German watch and so on. So, you know, connectivity issues were, were not really good. And since, you know, activity tracking, you need to connect other devices. I mean, or, or so, you know, just to keep tracking of what you are doing. So if you don't have a good um, connectivity um, uh, uh, infrastructure in the app, you know, like or so, then you know, this leads to kind of major issues. Yeah, yeah, sorry, my, my son jumped into the room in the middle, by the way. Yeah, yeah, uh, no yeah. so the, I this reminded me of this recent news about so I, I don't know the exact app name, but it's called something like Strada or something like I, I guess it's tracks your running route and then it gives you some rating or whatever. But apparently uh, there was a, a Russian commander using this app to yeah. kind of publish their I don't know, like running time and like where they're running. And the, the news said that because they were using this app, uh, they were somehow uh, assassinated because the people knew where uh, this person was running and then they oh, use no. this app to <laughs> track and then kind of uh, yeah, assassinate the commander. I yeah, don't know how but, true the news is, but th th that's what the news were playing. Yeah, and that's why actually, like, again, there was massive yeah, privacy time, concerns. Yes, yes. And especially, you know, when the app doesn't really, like, for example, why um, 
fitness tracking app will need, for example, you know, to uh, access my contact list, for example. You know, I mean, for yeah. me, it doesn't really kind of uh, make any sense. But when you read in the privacy policy, for example, they state how oh, we might access your contact list to provide like recommendations, you know, like, I mean, mm -hmm. they link it somehow that they give oh. a reason, but it's not really kind of valid reason. And when when people report, you know, the issues, it's quite indicate that they didn't read the privacy policy because if they read the privacy policy, like for example, I, I don't remember if it was in my fitness, I think it was my fitness pal app that it's written in the privacy policy that all data are actually transferred and processed of use, like data of users are transferred and processed in the United States. And mm. someone, you know, uh, like was raising that he got a notification or something about it in the app and was asking why. And, you know, they are saying why in the privacy policy. So, you know, it just, but they are lengthy, they are complicated. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there is kind of like a question or comment about this in the chat. And the yeah, comment says so, maybe the difference between ratings of women's health apps and fitness apps is related to the uh, gender of the user base. Presumably yeah. men are more likely to use fitness apps. Yeah, so let's go mm -hmm. with uh, here a uh, question. So she is asking, uh, when reading a complex privacy policy, which parts do you think uh, a reader must go through? So this is, again, very, very um, hard question because they are very, very lengthy and there should be a way, again, they should be summarized somehow and give you an indication of what's happening uh, uh, with your with your data. Is it actually um, like, for example, you know, like kind of a small table that shows you your data will be shared with third parties of this field, you know, to to have this benefit, for example, or to do, do is the app will require any future payments or not, and so on. So it really kind of, I would say, as I mentioned, you know, better approaches are needed to ensure that users are actually aware of what is inside the privacy policies without having the need, you know, to read all the policy. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes I think some apps or some kind of like websites for some kind of services when you want to sign up, they have kind of like key points that kind of summarizes some things. Exactly. But I don't know, probably not apps, not all apps. Do this, yeah. yeah, exactly. Like this one, as I showed here, but uh, uh, yeah, here for example, this app Strava, oh, yeah. right? Like, but still, you know. Oh, yes, Strava. Yeah, I guess that's the name. Yeah, this is actually still um, not very clear because, for example, like I mean, normal user when they read, do we sell your personal information? It say here, no. Do we share or sell aggregate information? They say yes. Ah. And still, it's not clear, really. Um, you know what's going on so you know in order to understand more you need to go through the policy so it's kind of challenging you know but uh yeah yeah, yeah. okay uh any last questions from anyone okay Seems not. So I think we may then conclude the session here. Yeah. Um. Thank you, Omar, first uh, for your very interesting talk, and thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, hope to see you all in the next seminar. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Mohammed, and thanks uh, for inviting me, and thanks all for attending. Thank you. Thank you.